Hello and welcome to the Hopeless Podcast. My name is Delphia, I'm your host, and joining me today is the J&J crew. We've got Jason and Joseph, so welcome, welcome guys. Hello. Hi, thanks for having us. Awesome, so good to have you guys on, and uh, we missed you last week, Joseph. You weren't able to come on, but uh, it's good to see you again. And today, we have another guest on. This time we've got Lisa Newhart from the United States. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you for having me. Uh, so so good to have you on and um so who are you like we're having all these different people on there's so many different backgrounds so who are you where are you from what's your family what do you do ministry different things like that fill us in questions there (laughs) that's a great question i'm still trying to figure out the answer you know i'm like um let's see here i'm 41 i think and my kids are like late teens you know and all these kids around me they're like you know this is what i'm this is who I am. And I finally figured out and I just look at them and I laugh and I say, you know what? God constantly changes us. We have no clue where we're going to be in the future. We might even be working as a certain profession today. And that means nothing for tomorrow. I mean, God has changed my profession so many times. He's changed my passion so many times. He's changed what I do so many times that honestly, I have learned to just hold on to the Lord and go along for the ridiculously great life. So basically, my name is Lisa. I live in Washington State in the United States of America. I um, have three sons and a husband. My sons are 19, 17, and 14. Wow. Mm. Nice. And you do have a ministry, don't you? What's that all about? What is it called? So we do have a ministry. It's called New Hearts, the number four Christ. And that was something that very accidentally happened. I never desired to go into ministry, Um, but what happened was the Lord um, came and impressed my husband and I that we were to quit our jobs, sell our home, sell everything that we have, and totally move, and we lived by both sides of our family. We planned on dying in the house that we lived in, and we thought we like had our perfect life mapped out, the perfect jobs, everything, and so we took a step of faith, and we literally quit our jobs, sold our home, everything, And we decided that we needed to work on family relationships. And so we decided what better way than to take all of us and put us in a motorhome and live together for four months and travel the United States. So as we were traveling the United States, um, our relationships were greatly improved in that little tiny space. We all got to know each other really well, which sometimes, you know, doesn't happen with our regular normal business life of going to work and coming home and you think you see the kids but I remember the kids looking at me and saying for the first time I know who my dad is and I'm thinking what do you mean we've had Sabbaths together we've had family trips all over what do you mean but again there's something totally different than when you're actually spending every day all day long together as a family and in this process we went to um like it was a historical um trip basically and we went to all these historical places all over the United States. But in that, we also went to early Adventist heritage sites, for example, like, you know, Battle Creek, Michigan, obviously had several locations there. We went to um, just several other places all throughout the United States. And when we went to these places, you know, we've been Adventists. Um, My kids on my husband's side, they are seventh generation Seventh-day Adventists. On my side, I've never stopped to count my family was Seventh-day Baptist back in 1700s, then became Seventh-day Adventist again at the beginning of that formation. And so we're Seventh-day Adventists more generations than we can count. But I've really learned that that means nothing because I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist unless I've actually come to know Jesus Christ, first of all. And second of all, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist unless I actually know where we came from and what we believe. Just because my preceding fathers were part of that means nothing for myself. And as we went to these Adventist heritage sites and we heard and the stories of these people and what they had gone through and, um, and all of that, we were so inspired that we, I think kind of as a family, we realized, wow, we have a lot of spiritual growth to, to go through. We really don't know Jesus Christ. We're just kind of like professed habitual Seventh-day Adventists, but what does it actually mean to know Christ? And to be able to go through trials and to still have faith and trust in him. 
And so what would happen is, is as we were traveling on the road, living in this motorhome, like every Friday night, we'd stay in a church parking lot and Sabbath morning, inevitably, you know, the elders or deacons would come knock on the door thinking we were, you know, like homeless people who <laughs> could leave or something. And, um, you know, we'd be all dressed in our church clothes, ready for church to be like, hey, what's the <laughs> and so that was always kind of fun. And then as we would sit in the pew, all of our family, um, I talk about it a little bit more in our um, program. We have an hour long program called Growing in Christ that goes through my testimony more in detail. All my kids were just born musical. At the time, I had no clue why. Now I know why. So as we'd sit in the pew, our family would just be singing in five part harmony and people would hear us and they'd walk up to us and be like, hey, could you guys like do special music in five minutes? And so we kind of got used to like every church just did that. And so in that process, people would ask us, you know, like, because we were like, you know, a week's drive away from home and people would be like, what are you guys doing out here? Like in a motorhome, all of you together. And so we would start telling our story of how God had told us to sell everything. And we were in this motorhome and we didn't know where we were going or what we were doing, but we were just on an adventure of faith. And people were so inspired by our music. And so what happens, people were just like, hey, you guys have got to start a ministry. And we kept laughing at them. We're like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm a nurse by profession. My husband's a mechanic. We love to farm. We love to work. We're workers. We are not ministry people. And so we just kept telling people that, well, one day we were walking out of church and this lady grabs my hand and she's like, I have a vision of you guys dressed in 1800s costumes, telling early Adventist heritage stories and singing. And I'm like, oh, how sweet, you know, like crazy lady. <laughs> and um, so I walked back out and we got in the motor home. We were driving the next day and my husband and I were talking. And I said, okay, honey. So the Lord has now told us what clothes we're supposed to wear what we're supposed to talk about and what we're supposed to sing. <laughs> so are we going to embark on the next step of faith? And now we're actually going to start a ministry, even though none of us want to, or have any clue how to. And so basically, again, we just threw it back to Lord. We said, okay, Lord, we're willing to, you find someone who will make us 1800s clothes that can't happen. So the deal's sealed. Well, within a day, we had someone who would make us 1800s costumes. Wow. Then we're like, Oh boy. So then we're like, okay, Lord, you've got to figure out the program because I don't know what exactly how I'm going to tell these stories. So I sat down at a computer and in an hour, I had these stories like all typed out in a beautiful way of things that I didn't even know existed. And then we said, okay, the number one thing I hate is marketing. So if you want us to come and sing, then you're going to have to have people invite us. And so again, we have never done any marketing really. It's been people word of mouth who have heard about us and invited us to come. And so that's how we accidentally got into ministry. A really long story, I know, but pretty spectacular, I think. Wow. That's, that's really cool, though. Right. Like the, the sequence of events. And I've watched, uh, I believe, both your music programs, Growing in Christ, and that early Advent message that you guys presented. It's really cool. And uh, never knew that story behind the costumes, but that's, that's really interesting. So you said that you're like Adventist, Adventist, um, like longtime Adventist, but... Um, so you were raised in an Adventist home, but did you remain in a, like the church or did you kind of get wings and go off for a bit and then come back? So I was raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church and I would say I got more than wings. I got wings, I flew and I ended up in the gutter and I ended up in a situation beyond what most people would say had any hope. I would say I was totally hopeless. I mean, my coworkers told me this, my friends told me this, my family told me this. What ended up happening is um, I ended up in a situation with, um, in, an, in a very abusive marriage. And then I also had, um, my first child was born and he was born missing part of a chromosome. So basically nobody else on planet earth has the same genetic mutation that he does. Um, when he was two days old, he went, he stopped breathing in my arms. He went into heart failure. And that was a very hopeless moment for me because he had pulled me out of my drugs and out of my bad life because he was my only hope. And so I was living for him. And so here I had barely managed to drag myself out of the gutter to live for this child. And this child was going to be what finally cured my heart and caused me to feel love. And now this very child was lying dead within my arms. Wow. And so it caused me to hit absolute rock bottom. At that point, I knew that Christ was the only thing that I needed and I needed him now. And so that really sparked 
I would just say an actual personal relationship. Even at that point, I was like attending church, but that was the first time I was like, I don't need church. I need Jesus Christ. Hmm. And I need now. And so again, I went through this abusive marriage with this child who was going in and out of surgeries. He's had more surgeries than I can count. He was fed by a feeding tube of his first three years of life. And at the same time, um, I also was basically immediately pregnant, like back to back. And so my coworkers, um, people even from church, my good friends told me, you know what, you need to have an abortion. God would understand. There's no way that you can sit here and financially take care of you and your family and take care of a child in and out of children's hospital nonstop. And you're pregnant. And also when I get pregnant, I basically grow up nonstop for nine months until the child comes out. And so they're like, there's no way you can do this. And so, you know, I hate to admit it, but I prayed to the Lord and I said, I can't take life with a clean conscience, but would you please remove this life from me? That sounds very reasonable to me. And so I prayed to the Lord earnestly that he would take this life from me. And he did not. And when that child was born, he was a pretty easy baby. And not only was he a pretty easy baby, but like at nine months old, he started running around talking. And what ended up happening is that my first son looked at this other child and was like, what is that? And he didn't want to be left out. And so he actually started copying him in terms of eating and walking and doing all these activities. And so that was a huge eye opener to me in my relationship with Christ to realize that the very one thing that I thought was like beyond the point that I could do, like I was hopeless at that moment, that very moment though, that very thing was actually the very thing that I needed for my life and for my son. And so again, my oldest son is now 19. Um, that's Lucas. Um, Levi is 17 and they're still extremely close and they still are complete buddies. And Lucas um, continues to, again, just be Levi's right-hand man and help him with things. And so I mm -hmm. praise the Lord for hopeless situations that are actually the very medicine that we need for ourselves and the predicament we're in. That's crazy. Like how yeah. everything just like slotted in. It was like, I guess it kind of blows your mind. It must be like a very humbling experience where, you know, you, as you said, like it was hopeless, but then, you know, it goes like, Oh no, it isn't. It, it's not like, I, I'm just I'm using this as a process. And how did that impact you? Like that must've been like very astounding. You know, I've tried to remember that through the years. I think sometimes we can like learn a lesson from God and like, you know, when we experience it, even that lesson, it took you know, about two years from the time of pregnancy for me to actually realize that God's answer was that very thing that I deemed a curse. Mm -hmm. And I try to remember that sometimes in my life, but I think that, you know, as human beings and fleshly that we are, we forget about it. And so it's like so many times, you know, maybe there's a, a you know, a frustrating situation, wherever it is in the family, at church, personally, health-wise or whatever, it can be easy to like fall down and think, this is it. I'm done. I'm frustrated. I'm hopeless. Like I'm sick and tired of this. And yet I have tried to remind myself, like in those moments, do I stop and realize that God is a good God and he sends good things to me. And so I may not see this as being good, but do I stop and really realize, you know what, this is an awesome, good thing. Um, you know, just another personal example recently, like um, we got COVID this last April. And again, I'm sitting there laying in bed thinking, okay, Lord, I'm like being a missionary for you. I'm out doing all this stuff for you. How in the world did you allow me to get COVID? Isn't it your job to like protect me or something? Isn't that what a truly loving God does? I mean, I hate to admit it, but that's what I'm sitting there thinking. And as I'm slowed down laying in bed, I pick up this book that somebody left behind at my home on accident. That's about, um, women martyrs for Christ. And like within three pages, I'm like, I stand rebuked. Like here's mm -hmm. people who have gone through so much more and they're praising God. And then I'm just sick in bed for a few days. And I'm like, where are you Lord? And so, you know, actually, again, God showed himself during that illness. I grew closer to him. And then later on, I discovered the blessing. Now I can go and I can um, help people who are sick with COVID and I don't have to worry about getting that. And so, you know, again, now that I look back, COVID was actually a huge blessing to our family. Yeah, for me. Um, also, uh, I think that a lot of people don't realize that when they hit that rock bottom, at the bottom there, there's a rock that you can stand on. And that rock is Jesus Christ, you know? And um, 
it's, it's such a beautiful story to realize that we can fall on that rock and we can actually find a firm foundation. And, uh, and that's what you've, you've found there, you know, in your hopelessness, you found a firm foundation that, you know, uh, you can rebound from. And uh, I wonder how many people are actually, you know, um, experiencing similar situation or, you know, hopeless situation or, or a situation that they think is hopeless, but in fact, you know, it's an opportunity for change and an opportunity for growth. Um, yeah, and I think we have to remember that there's a difference between religion and there's a difference between Christ, our rock. Because again, I knew my Bible backwards and forwards. I had been through, you know, church and all these different religious things my whole life. I mean, I had been a, a leader, like a youth Christian leader my whole life. But there's a difference between knowing all the Bible stories and knowing all the facts and knowing Christ as a personal best friend and knowing that he's there for us and that he delivers us. And, you know, maybe I'm a little bit late figuring it out in life, but again, just knowing that even when I am overcome with whatever trial or emotion I'm overcome with, I can stop in that moment. I can pray and I can actually feel God's presence inside. And, you know, I wish somebody would have taught that to me as a kid because it would have saved me a lot of years of heartache and distress and feeling hopeless to know that, you know what, I'm never hopeless because Christ is always right here with me. I just have to stop and say, hey, Lord, here I am. I need you. And poof, he's there with me. And I can feel him there with me, guiding me. Mm. Wow. That's that's really good how, you know, I think a lot of the time we see it as a impersonal God. Well, I think that's every other religion but our like our Christian faith, where it's like, you know, God is there with us through everything that we're going through. And what other events happened in your life that really impacted you? You know, I briefly mentioned like when we um, quit our jobs, sold our home, moved everything, that was probably really huge. Um, but actually, I'd probably go back actually before that. So probably one of the hugest things that's changed my life is the word of God. And I know that's like, yeah, that's obvious, but I don't know. I don't think it's so obvious. Again, like I grew up in church, you know, I memorized my memory verses every week. I did all these things. I knew my Bible backwards and forwards, but there's a difference between like reading our Bible and knowing our Bible and like our Bible being a personal love letter from Christ to me or my personal directions for the day. And that's actually what happened when I was going through the middle of this divorce um, it seemed like I was going to lose everything, even the kids. And I claimed God's word like I had never done before. And I claimed, Lord, you are my judge. I'm going before this judge who doesn't seem to understand the situation. Because again, you know, attorneys and everyone gets involved and the truth gets twisted. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, I'm going to trust you to be my judge. And we got down to the final. Um, we actually went to trial. And at the trial date, um, basically, like everything asset wise was split 50 50 and the kids time with the kids was split 50 50 and to me I basically was like Lord where were you I trusted you and I don't care about the assets but I care about my kids and I leaving an abusive relationship trying to save our lives and you're going to continue to put them in that and where are you Lord well part of the situation was was he was actually going to prison for um, a year and a half and so um he the initial time he would be in prison wouldn't be able to see them well during that time a crazy events were orchestrated and actually we even though the judge had already given his final order we were actually called back into court um a few weeks later and the judge totally reversed his decision and gave me 100 percent of the assets and gave me 100 percent of the kids and lifetime protection order for all of us and so that was the first i would say taste of like claiming god's word and then later on, I like got married, had another son. And it's like, because times were good, it's like, I wouldn't read my Bible so much, you know, when you're in the honeymoon stage and life is great. And then it's like, when times are tough, you know, you're trying to raise these three little toddlers, then I'd be like, oh, back to reading my Bible. And I went back and forth like this for years. And it's like, I'd experienced God, I'd taste him and he'd be so wonderful. But then I don't know, the world would just allure me away, busy things, you know, fake happiness. And I remember one day where I said to my family, okay, I'm up tomorrow morning to read my Bible again. And somebody was like, yeah, and how long is it going to last this time? And you know, those words hit me. And out of pure stubbornness, because I'm pretty stubborn, I was like, this time it's lasting for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And as I began to embark on that journey, 
it was hard for our family. I thought, you know, now that I've made this decision to do it for the rest of my life, life should be smooth, right? No. When we give ourselves to Christ, I just warn people now, the devil's going to attack you like never before. So you better plan on it. And so, but you know what, within a short time, God changed that around and all of our family decided we all needed to start reading our Bibles every morning. So we all started reading our Bibles. That was January 1 of 2017. And we would read our Bible first for about half an hour. And then we would have family devotions together. And it was um, March of that same month. So only like eight weeks later that we heard God's voice tell us to sell everything and move. And it radically changed our lives. And so to this day, we as a family continue to do this. And I just find that like, I keep thinking, okay, I've like grown in Christ. I'm done, right? Nope. Tomorrow he's got another lesson for me. And the next day it's another lesson. And it's just one cool, neat thing and neat experience after another that God brings. Mm. And I think like a lot of us, like I was, I'm not as Adventist as you, but um, I'm probably like, fourth generation probably on mom's side but like you know same thing you know people are like oh you know you know everything like I've got baptismal studies and the guy's like oh you you already know all this and it's just like yeah I may but that may not mean that I have a connection with Christ as you were saying it's like you know all these head all this head knowledge but nothing is going to the heart and um, I think that's something that is really important to make sure that that continues to happen, that it's a heart relationship with him, not just that, oh, I've got to do this because God's word, because I'm a good Adventist, I know that he says that I should be doing it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is so true. Um, yeah. Sorry, Joseph. Uh, no, I really like the testimony. I'm just trying to take a bit away from that. So I was thinking, oh, should, should I go ahead and sell everything I have and just make <laughs> make a track across Australia and just live with, live an adventure? I'm just trying to trying to pick away. And then as I was thinking that, something came to my mind and it was, um, you know, the, the story of the uh, Jesus counsels the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. Um, and then basically um, in Matthew 19, 21, Verse 21, it says, Jesus said unto him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have the treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. 22, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So I think it's easy for us um, to think of our lives as oh, I haven't yet achieved what I wanted to achieve, or I'm, I'm not I haven't attained that fake happiness yet. So I'm still on this pursuit, but really we've been blessed with so much and we just don't see that perspective. And I think that really we just need to step back, read our Bible and pray. And then that's when we realize that we are so richly blessed and that we have so much to give to others that to them, we look like we are rich and, and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what I take from that snip of that story. And I'm just absorbing this story in and I take this as a great learning lesson. Well, I don't, I don't think you've got much to worry about there, Joseph. I mean, you're young, you're rich, you just need to be a ruler. <laughs> um, but I remember there's one, I think it's in uh, Ecclesiastes or Proverbs, that he that has a rule over his spirit is better than um, a mighty warrior that takes takes a, a city. And I think sometimes we, yeah, you know, we, we often look for the outside things, you know, but um, there can be much more that we can achieve when we when we look, you know, inside and we, we allow Christ to work on us inside, um, to have that full control over, you know, our, our thoughts, over our spirit, really. Um, I'll have to find that verse, but I think it's pretty much what he's saying. He that has rule over his spirit is much greater than one that takes a city. Um, yeah, that's in Proverbs. Proverbs, yeah. <laughs> mm, that's really interesting. So um, I guess one of the big things here that was being mentioned is that having a heart relationship with him, and I've you know, kind of mentioned that before, but how does one like grow in Christ and have this relationship with him? Like you said, that it's not just reading your Bible, like every day, you could say that makes you a true, true Christian. So what is like the actual essence of being a true Christian growing in Christ? 
you know, I just get more excited, I guess, each year, because I feel like each year God shows me more practical ways to grow deeper. And I think about like human relationships and is it it the same way? Like we can start a relationship with someone for one year, five years, 10 years, but there's always more to grow. There's always more to learn. And that's what's so exciting. I, when I talk to people and um, who are like trying to earnestly seek Christ, what I tell them is number one, you need to read your Bible because that is God's letter to us. And so it's like, how can I have a relationship? If someone's talking to me and I refuse to listen, it's not going to work. And so the number one thing is, is it's easy. Pick up the Bible. That is God speaking. And not only is he telling stories, but do I stop at each story and say, okay, how does that affect me? Like what you did, Joseph, just now with that rich young ruler. I can read the story of the rich young ruler and go, oh, great. Another Bible story to tell a children's story this week. But do I actually stop and say, okay, how does that affect my heart? Mm. And again, it's not that necessarily Christ is saying, Lisa, sell everything you have and give to the poor. But the point in that story is, where is my heart? The man walked away because he wasn't willing to sell what he had for Christ. And so it's a great opportunity for me to say, as I read that story, okay, Lord, have I given you my all today? Or is there something that I value so much that I'm not willing to give up for you? And so it's taking whatever verse I'm reading, like the one that you uh, mentioned, Jason, I love that verse about a man who rules his spirit is um, more mighty than a man who conquers a city. You know, I use that verse a lot of times with my boys. Again, like, what does this verse mean for me today? You want to be strong? You guys want to go have your wrestling competitions? Go rule your spirit. That's a stronger man than whoever can win any wrestling competition. And so taking that word of God and applying it to life. The second thing that, you know, I'm really learning is the story of the man who said, there was the Pharisee who said, oh Lord, I'm so glad I'm not as bad of a sinner as the other man over there. And then there was the other man saying, oh Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two classes of people. Which one am I? Am I the person who's earnestly seeking Christ each morning saying, you know what? In and of myself, I'm still in the gutter doing drugs and sleeping around. That's Lisa Newhart. I need Jesus Christ in me every day, because if not, that's still who I am. And so just really realizing that even though I may have, you know, um, achieved something great in life, it's not me that's achieved it. It's Jesus Christ alone. And so just having that attitude, do I seek the Lord surrendering myself and then asking him to come in? Because if it's just me saying, okay, Lord, help me do this today. Help me do that today. It's still Lisa new heart living. And I need to die. And I want Jesus Christ to come inside of me and to be the one living out of me. And so I think when we have that relationship with Christ, where we're, we realize who we are in him, we're also kings and queens of the universe, are we not, as his children? But just realizing that he is my owner. He's my creator. He's my redeemer. He's everything to me. And that is my identity. And when we have that relationship where we're talking to him and he's talking to us through the word of God and through the Holy Spirit, that still small voice, then that is all we need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Mm. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah, that was really interesting. So I think it's like a lot of us surface read, I think, the Bible where, as you said, it's just a story. You know, it's not like personal. I don't know that that's been coming up a, a bit like God's a personal God that Bible is a personal message to you. And then he wants you to go and be personal with him, I think. So it's like, it's that balance where it's like, you know, he wants that same thing. So, and I found it interesting when I listened to your testimony um, on YouTube with the more extended version where you were saying about, you know, how, you know, we try and find love in so many different places, but it's truly Christ that only has that true love and the true longing. As Joseph said, it's, We're looking for that fake happiness, which we won't really ever find. Um, But in Christ, you know, we can have that true happiness, that true love, you know, that, you know, no one else can go and take away from us. And I was reading a um, a Christian women's magazine and they were saying about contentment and singleness and that everyone thinks that it's not possible. And they're like, well, if you can't be content in singleness, you're not going to be content when you're married either. So that's right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so there was a uh, saying that you know you've got to go and learn to have Christ as your all and in all before you can go to any other stage like you have to go and learn right here right now in the position that you're in that relationship they would wants to have with you 
before you can go on to be married to this, that, and the other. And I think that's something that you are uh, kind of saying as well is that, you know, yeah, like you were looking for love, you know, in your child, in, you know, relationships, stuff like that. But it was only in Christ that you truly found love. Yes. And, you know, I think that that's something that I wish, again, I would have learned as a young kid. But, you know, it's like as a young kid, it's like we look at it maybe from our parents, you know, looking for that approval, looking for that relationship with our mom and dad that's just unrivaled. And when that doesn't seem to work, because I've learned that all human relationships fail. It's just how it is. There is no human relationship that's going to be perfect. I mean, we stick through them, but I'm just saying that no one is going to ever perfectly treat us the way that we want to be treated our whole life. Mm -hmm. And so human relationships fail. So the thing is, is, you know, as kids, we go from it being from our parents. And when that doesn't work, usually we turn to our peers and, you know, our peers eventually fail us. And then it's like, yeah, we're looking for the perfect spouse. And then we get married and we think, okay, now we're finally going to be in love. And actually it is more lonely and more miserable to be married than to be single because now we have even more challenges. And then we're like, oh, the kid, now that'll bring it. Oh, really? Now we bring in something, I, what I call is each level refines my character even more. You know, marriage refines our character and then we have a kid and it refines our character even more and they become teenagers and it's even more. And it's like, as life goes on and then it's like, we can tend to get, again, look for love in a profession in terms of look at what I've become and look at how good I am at my job. And then it's wealth and then it's the perfect house. And maybe it's even perfect country living in the perfect garden. And maybe it's even the perfect ministry and the perfect church leadership position. And it's like, we as humans, we just keep trying to find things that fill that hole until we reach rock bottom and realize it's Jesus alone. And so, you know, I look at how many years I wasted and that really breaks my heart. And I just pray my kids learn from me and they stick with the Lord through it. And they don't have to go through all those ditches um, to learn how good the Lord is. Mm, that's really interesting as well. So in wrapping up with final thoughts and everything, Lisa, what are, what are your thought, final thoughts, I guess? And, you know, what do you really want the rest of the listeners to get out of this? If there's like just one thing that you want them to get out of it, what is it? You know, I would just say that there is no condition on earth that is hopeless. I have been in situations so many times that seemed absolutely hopeless. And God always comes through at the right time in the right way. And sometimes at the moment, we don't see that. But if we can keep on living and look back, we will see that God is always faithful and always good. And, you know, we may fail. I mean, there are so many times where, you know, it's like I made a commitment. Okay, Lord, I'm coming back to you. And then I would slide back into the world again. And so many times I do it back and forth and back and forth. And I just think that no matter how many times we've done it, no matter how many times we have felt in a hopeless situation, God is always still here for us today. And there is always hope and there's always peace when we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus Christ. Hmm. And that's a beautiful point as well. Um, Joseph, we'll start with you. What is your final thoughts? My final thoughts would be um, I really taken like a great learning lesson from Lisa and her testimony. And I just see that um, there was a great turning point um, in her testimony. And I feel like it also can apply in many lives. Like um, so don't wait until someone is hospital hospitalized or uh, there's a death or there's some big um, shift uh, paradigm shift in your life until then oh you come in to realize like I think it's really important to listen to our elders and those who have experience because they've really been through that and they're trying to share their knowledge and experience to help you grow better as a better person and also in Christ so I think that we know like eating good healthy food vegetables and fruit it might not taste nice brussels sprouts and things like that so then we turn to our junk food we we we, we love this and we, we we turn to the ice cream and the lollies and chips and all the salty foods that taste good for a while but then we have all these sicknesses that come up and say oh okay we have to go ahead and eat our vegetables and all these good foods so i can become healthy again and and at that point in time you already people it's like the stage where they're young 
and uh, they're, they're growing up and then they get into the middle age and then they want to just have their fun and then they come old and they're like oh okay no god is real i want i, w- I want to pursue him and that's the stage where you, where you um, eat the junk food and now you're turning back to the vegetables and the healthy things don't wait until that you already know better and uh, you have to shake yourself and wake up and say hey th- this is this is the way to go you have to listen to the people that um, have experience like that because they really love you and care for you and that's why they're sharing the testimony like like uh, Lisa is now. So um, that's what I've taken from this is don't wait for that big turning point. Have that change, make that first step. Mm. And I love what you said about, um, I think it was Pastor Doug Batchelor. He gave the example of why start serving God when you're 70 and serve him for 10 years? Why not start when you're 10 and serve him for 70 years? So I think that's um, something else that is really important that I love that you brought up, Joseph and Jason. What are your final thoughts? Yeah, I think I was probably going to go something similar to that as well. Uh, I realized when, when Lisa was speaking there saying, you know, people look for that love. They look for that fulfillment in so many other different things, you know, in life. And I realized that young people, they can't wait these days. You know, just can't wait to sort of grow up so they can get out there and start, you know, uh, enjoying life and the clubs. They can't wait to get married can't wait to get their first job so they can get their first car to, you know, get their, you know, get to whatever destination they want to get to. They can't wait to get their first house and all these kind of things. It doesn't really give you, you know, fulfillment. You think it will do, but it doesn't. And, um, you know, Lisa said that ultimate fulfillment, that love that you're looking for is actually found in Jesus Christ. So why not, you know, um, give them a try and see because you know it, you won't be. I know you won't be disappointed. Um, it says, "Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and uh, that His mercy endureth forever." And I, and I think you know we got to try that before you try anything else. Um, yeah, try Jesus. Hmm. I think that's a really good point. And my wrapping up thought was how Lisa said that you know nobody is too hopeless to be rescued by God. And I guess that's why our title, our name has a question mark in it. Are we really hopeless? So I think, yeah, as she said, you know, no, we aren't hopeless because there, as Jason put, and I love how he put that, we'll hit rock bottom and that rock is Jesus Christ. And I just loved that, how, you know, yeah, we either, you know, we can't go and save ourselves by any means but it's by sinking down that we can go and reach Christ's arms. And I think that's, that's just so beautiful that, you know, Christ comes to our level to help us get up to his level. And um, I think that's something that I just want all our listeners to take away is, you know, you aren't just left, left for dead. You just, you know, who cares about you? There's someone who does care about you way more than anyone else does. And that's Jesus Christ. And he loves you that much that he died for you and that he wants to have a personal relationship with you. So I think that's just what I want to put out there to our listeners, whether you're a Christian or not, you know, as Lisa said, brought up in a Christian home. I was as well, you know, I'm sure a lot of us were brought up in Christian homes, but it's our individual decision if we want to go and serve Christ. So that's what I want to go and just put out there that we can go and serve Christ with a and complete heart and that there's nothing in between us and him so so i'm going to share that video with with you one of uh, one of the videos from uh from lisa and uh her ministry so i'll share that with you right now chose me before the world was known he chose me to be his very home he made me then let me choose my way i chose to move away Taken wing, he loved me. When I lost everything, he brought me. Redemption's work was done through Jesus Christ, his Son. Who shall separate? 
separate me from the love of God. Shall dreams of tomorrow, pain or sorrow, can the need of food or earthly possessions, the threat of war or man's oppression, in all these things, victory is our reward, victory is our reward, through Jesus Christ our Lord. sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to Separate me from the love of God. Of this I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to What uh, message did you grab from that, uh, Jason? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen. Uh, and he tells us as well. I think I love that song. Great. And now you can uh, end it off. If you want to go and listen to the full version of Lisa's testimony and also the whole musical program, you can find that at New Hearts Number Four Christ, and then that's on YouTube as well as they've got a Facebook page, and their website is www.newheartsnumberfourchrist.com. And this episode of Hopeless was brought to you by the Avon Valley SDA Church, and they are our proud sponsors. And you can check that out on YouTube as well as Instagram and Facebook. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you.